Well, good morning. Um, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Melissa. I serve here as the executive pastor, and I'm excited that you're with us. I hope to see you at the picnic afterwards. If you haven't had the Bowman barbecue sandwich, you're in for a treat and all the yummy sides and things that are happening. So um, thankful that we're going to be able to raise money for camp. I got to go with the students to camp for the last two summers. I'm still exhausted, but um, that's good. It's fun because uh, I lots of kids and I'm old. Okay, so, but it, it really is an awesome, awesome thing for our students and our kids to experience. It's just removing them from everyday life and just immersing them in conversations and in worship and in time to think about their relationship with Christ. And so um, it is a worthy investment um, to help our kids go to camp, and we want to take a whole bus load to New Mexico this summer. And so um, just showing up and playing the golf tournament um, and, and doing things like that really helps send those kiddos um, and then some of us crazy adults to camp. So thank you for that. Um, I'm glad you're here today. We're continuing in the series in the life of David. Bill kicked us off last week with a great message. I really encourage you to go back and watch that message. Um, just talking about giving us an overview of who David is, um, talking about how why God called him a man after his own heart, and just how important the condition of our hearts are to God. Um, and, and today we're going to be looking at kind of one of David's most like famous moments in his highlight reel of life is David and Goliath. And maybe you've heard that story and you're like, oh, I've heard this a million times. Just hang on with me. There's still something to learn from it. But, uh, you know, the premise of it, if you've never heard the details of the story, is just like that classic underdog story, right? The little guy takes on the big guy. You know, it's like we love underdog stories like Rudy and Miracle on Ice and Mighty Ducks, right? And like, I know I just like age myself with those, but great underdog stories. And so this story of David and Goliath is kind of the OG of the underdog stories. And that this is where we really get to dive into characteristic of David, which is this crazy courage that he had in the face of something really scary. And so we'll be in 1 Samuel uh, 17. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to open there. If you don't know where 1 Samuel is in your Bible, it's okay. There's a table of contents in every single Bible. We encourage you to use it so you can navigate your way to 1 Samuel. Um, and so this chapter uh, opens up with a description of a battle or a soon-to-be battle happening between Israel and Saul, the King Saul, which Bill talked about last week, and the Philistines, who are the Philistines are... There's just this aggressive, war-seeking, um, uh, polytheistic, they believe in many gods, uh, people that were encroaching on the land that the Israelites were given, and um, they were metal workers, so they had lots of different weapons and spears and swords and things to entail you with. So they were really scary, okay? But what we see is that they're lined up on either side of this huge valley, okay? And so they have, we have the Israelites on one side, the Philistines on the other side, and then it's a representative battle. So it's like they're going to send out their best to fight against each other, okay? So the Philistines have Goliath. Israelites have nobody. There's no one's answer in that call. So we're going to pick up there in verse 8. So join me there in verse 8. He stood, this is Goliath, and shouted to the Israelite battle formations, why do you come out to line up in battle? C come out, sorry, I'm going to start over. Why do you come out to line up in battle formation, he asked them. Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose one of your men and have him come down to me. So he is calling out the Israelites. He's making this bold threat that he's going to fight for his people. He's a champion of his people, and he challenges Israel to send a man forward. And this is a response. When Saul and all Israel heard these words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. So, we kind of know where they're sitting. So, we got a guy calling us out, and Saul and his folks are terrified. There's other versions that say dismayed, afraid. Um, and when we're kind of thinking of, like, what does afraid mean, what does terrified mean, because it's, it's hard to, like, you look it up, it means to fear. And you're like, okay, that's not a very helpful, helpful definition. But... Um, Jen uh, Wilkin quoted this in one of her books. I thought it was so great about what fear is. Fear is our response to uncertainty, uh, to the uncertainty about our resources in the face of danger. 
when we are assaulted by a force that overwhelms us and compels us to face that we are helpless and out of control. Fear is provoked when the threat of physical, relational, or emotional danger exposes our inability to preserve what we most deeply cherish. So what's happening with Israel and Saul is what happens with many, many of us that when we're facing something we're afraid of. We're, we're looking across the valley and we're comparing ourselves to our enemy. And we're saying, mm, I, I don't have the resources, the strength, the courage to overcome that. And then that's when that fear creeps in. So when Saul and his armies heard the words of Goliath and they saw him, they believed that they were going to lose and they were too weak. And so as, as we're starting this morning, I, I want us to kind of gleam onto this first point, is that we have to face the reality of fear. The thing is, fear is in our minds. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not real, that it's not doesn't serve us well to have fear or doesn't have a good purpose. I mean, if something's threatening the safety of our body or the people that we love, we will go into a survival mode called fight or flight. And, and fear sometimes serves us well to run and hide. Sometimes it serves us well to stand and fight. So fear has an element of value, too. And so just because it's in our mind does not mean that it's not real or that it's not necessary. So our, our fears are normally based in a reality. And looking at the reality here that Saul was facing, Goliath was a legitimate threat. In verses 4 through 7, I talked about how he was built. He was 9 foot and he had armor that weighed like as much as a 6th grader and like spears and like a shield bearer and all this stuff. Okay, so this was a formidable enemy who was scary. He was also trained as a warrior his whole life. So he knew what was in front of him. So it's not out of sorts for Saul and the army to be afraid. And I think what we can see here is, is this gives us permission to acknowledge our fears. It is not unspiritual or make us less, less faithful to say, I'm afraid. And I think in church, we, we, we do that. Like there's something lacking in our maturity, our spiritual maturity, to say, I'm, I'm scared right now. I think what we see in in uh, David, and we'll see this in his spiritual maturity in a way, is that actually he's ab able to develop the discipline to acknowledge fear, but also discern between the difference between the reality of fear and the illusion of fear. Okay, so let me kind of break that down a little bit. Like the illusion of fear. Like I am afraid of sharks, okay? Deathly afraid of sharks, okay? Okay. They're scary, and I already had someone come up to me after the first service and said, they're just like dogs. No, no, they are not, okay? They will eat you. No, they're not like dogs. They're scary. So when I'm in the ocean where they live, and that's their domain, they eat there, they hunt there, the fear that I have that I may encounter a shark in their home turf is legitimate. That is a legitimate fear. So my concern, my fear helps me make decisions gives me discernment. So it discerns, should I jump into a dark ocean? Should I swim with their food? Should I swim covered in blood? No, that's discernment, okay? These are legitimate, healthy fears. My fear is giving me ways to make decisions, okay? But alongside the reality is that we have to recognize that fear can quickly spin into illusion. Like the fear of a shark in, when you're in the ocean makes sense, right? But the illusion that a shark is in my dark pool because my husband's going, duh, 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 like to scare me, is not reality, okay? Like that's not reality, okay? So now I don't even want to swim in my dark pool. Like it, that's not reality. So it's like whatever we are afraid of gets scarier and bigger than it actually is. And, and we, get more, we feel more limited, and more scared. And as we start to spiral, facts do not matter anymore. I know for a fact there's not a shark in my pool, but the fear I fear feel is real. And so it makes it harder and more difficult to respond to what is actually happening. I mean, I know this is really simplified response, but we see this all the time. The fear that we have in life spins 
out of control into illusion and facts really don't matter anymore. Fear magnifies the reality of whatever it is we're afraid of, making it bigger, scarier, to the point that we become delusional and refuse to believe we have the resources at our disposal to confront fear. So we have to face the reality of our fears, okay? And by doing that, we have to embrace fear with faith. Now hear me. This is not a believe more, pray more, and you won't be scared message. I don't think that is responsible. I don't think that's true. I think there's reason that angels come upon people and say, do not be afraid. Like, this is a response to us. But we have to embrace fear with faith and in faith. So, so Saul should have been the one that stepped up. D- uh, Bill talked about this last week. Saul was big. He was bigger than most people. He would have been the one that maybe would have, would have sized up to Goliath a little bit. He was head and shoulders taller. He was also the king. But his fear clouded this truth that David would show him. And so when we say fear with faith, facing fear with faith, we have to know what faith means. And there's lots of definitions of faith. This is the one that I've kind of mashed up through things that I've learned in my life that helped me understand what faith is. Faith is choosing to believe that who God is and what his word says is true. Regardless of my circumstances, regardless of my, the pressure around me. Sorry, that was a baptismal. It scared me, sharks. I just had a moment. Okay. <laughs> yes, faith. We're having faith. There's no sharks in this room. Faith. So that is a choice to believe who God is and what the word says is true, regardless of how I'm feeling, regardless of what the world around me is saying, regardless of what pressures are saying, like uh, circumstances are saying, that's what faith is. And so David begins to show Saul this. So David, we see him come on the scene in verse 12. He's the youngest of Jesse's sons. Most of his sons are in Saul's army. So David says, hey, go to the camp and bring your brother's supplies. This is how I know God is good because he sends them with cheese. So there's another example of why God's good. Okay, so they've been there for 40 days, 40 nights. Goliath is calling them out. Nothing has happened. We see David roll up in verse 20. So join me there. David got up early, left the flock with someone to keep it loaded up, and sent out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp and heard the Philistine battle cry. They were lined up facing each other. He left his supplies in the care of a quartermaster and ran to the battle line. When he arrived, he asked his brothers, he asked his brothers how they were. While he was speaking to them, suddenly the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words. So he's repeating what the Israel army has been hearing for 40 days and 40 nights, which David heard for the first time. When all the Israelites saw Goliath, they retreated and they were terrified. Okay, so we see David coming on the scene, and he's hearing this, right? He's a little brother. He's hearing this, and he sees that they're terrified, okay? Now, I want us to look at David's response in contrast with the response we've been seeing with Saul and, and the army. Okay, so verse 26. David spoke to the men who were standing with him. What will be done for the man who kills the, that Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel. Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine, which that's a description of people who are outside the chosen people of God, that he should defy the armies of the living God. The troops told him about the offer, concluding that this is what will be done for the man who kills him. David's older brother was listened as he spoke to the men, and he became angry with him. He said, why did you come down here? Why did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness and know your arrogance and your evil heart? You came down here to see the battle. David, in a gaslighting little brother typical way, he says, what have I done now? I just asked a question. He turns and asks somebody else about the offer. They gave him the same answer before. And what David said was overheard and reported to Saul. So he brought David to him. David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. David was embracing this fear with faith. And, and why is, is really interesting. Because the, the army that, uh, and Saul saw Goliath challenging Israel. But the way David saw, he said, you challenge Israel, you're challenging God. Saul and the army said, oh, they're just cha- he's challenging us. David said, no, you're challenging God. 
And he understood that this whole battle had everything to do with God. Saul and the army were focused on themselves, that Goliath was bigger and stronger than they were. But David said, no, 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 he's not fighting us. We have the Lord of armies on our side. They had left God out of the whole battle plan. And the thing with fear is when you isolate it, what you, you, let me say this again. The thing that we fear, when we isolate it from the reality of God, that will scare the tarnation out of us. Because we are not equipped. We're not smart enough. We're not strong enough. We're not wise enough to fix every problem and to face every challenge and know what to do. And if you think you are, your friends think you're annoying, okay? Like, we're not, okay? We're not. We're not smart. That's not to be mean. That's to recognize our human limitations. But it's also to recognize our deep, deep need for a Savior. And that's where God wants us to operate from. It's from an, a level of dependence on him, utter dependence on him. And we recognize our humanity. We recognize how fear brings out our own limitations. And there's so many times we, we approach things that are afraid, we're afraid of from a place of arrogance. And, and fear can look like arrogance, like I'm the only one who can figure this out. I'm the only one who can handle this. I'm the only one who can do this. I'm, I'm all the help that I need. I've limited the resources, remember the resources that I had, the power that I have in involving God in this battle. I've limited that because I'm just trusting myself to win and I will never have enough to win every battle. When we say things like, you know, let go, let God, and like lay it at his feet and all these like churchy things that we say, I want to scream. Because I'm like, tell me how. Tell me what that means. Tell me how. And I believe that embracing fear with faith and in faith is recognizing that in everything we must include God in the battle plan. We have to ask for wisdom and discernment and direction and clarity. And in having faith, in the face of fears, we're saying we believe God is central to everything. Because he is in the business of saving and victory and freedom. That's what we're saying. Too many times... Too many times when I am afraid, I start to control, and I start to get anxious. And all of those feelings, that the control, that anxiety becomes central in my life, and it limits my faith, my resources, my power to myself. Embracing faith in the face of fear is living in submission and reverence to God. We, we read in Proverbs that it's the beginning of, beginning of wisdom comes from fear of God. And it's not like shaking and trembling like he's a big bad God. It's reverence. It's submission. It's recognizing that he is central to all that we do and all that we are. And his promises are true and will be kept. David recognizes Goliath only has the illusion of power. The illusion of strength. Because he is not in relationship with God. He is not fighting with the Lord of armies on his side. He worshiped false gods. But this little, this little shepherd boy, David, he knows God. He knows what God has done. And he's putting every circumstance, every fear that he is facing up against what God has revealed about himself to David. His courage, David's courage, his confidence is in the revealed nature of God. He has embraced fear with faith and he's submitting to God because my third point is he's submitting to God because he recognized he serves a God who fights for him. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, so he brought David to him. David said, Saul, don't be discouraged. Don't let anybody discourage you. Your servant will go fight this Philistine. And Saul said, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth, and he's been a warrior since he's been young. David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear come and carry off a lamb, I went after it, and I struck it down, and I rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared 
up against me, I would grab it by its fur and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. I love how David talks about his successes as a shepherd. So it's not a very intimidating job to be walking into battle with, right? But his, he's reading off this resume of overcoming these threats as a reason that he is so confident that he can defeat the Goliath. He isn't telling Saul all of these things. He isn't listing off his resume to Saul for Saul to trust David. He's listing off to prove that Saul can trust God to work in David. That's why he's saying, this is what God has done. David fights as a man who remembers. He remembers what God has done. And he knew he couldn't fight Goliath on his own with his own resume, his own resources. The only way he can win this fight is if the God who had been fighting for him against lions and bears did it again. And he believes that he will. Because we have a God that keeps his promises David could stare a giant down and know a victory is coming. We look at David's posture, y'all, and I, when Bill told me I was going to teach about David and Goliath, I was like, oh, I want to teach David and Goliath, you know? And God was like, you need to be teaching about David and Goliath. <laughs> and I was, I've been so convicted, so convicted. This whole time when I've been reading and rereading these verses, just keep thinking, David fights as a man who remembers what God has done. And it made me confront the, confront the fact that I'm a person who's forgotten. In the span of our lives, we will face so many challenges. I see parents of little ones, and I'm just like, just wait. <laughs> Get harder, you know, good luck. You know, some, some of our, our big we feel like they're going to take us down. It's like a tsunami coming at us. Maybe it's an illness or a job that we lose or a marriage that's on the rocks or we're at a crossroads in a relationship or with a decision or we're struggling to parent or care for our, 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 our parents and, our, you know, we're, we have addiction. I mean, there's a million, million challenges that we will face in life. And they pull us to the depths, the depths of darkness and despair. And I've found my default when I'm in the depths is I'm going to get to figuring it out and fixing it. So I'm like, I can figure this out. I can do this. There's always a solution to a problem. I just need to work harder. I need to be more creative. I need to find the right answer. I need to work, 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 find, find, find. Control, control, control. And I'm going to bend this problem to my will. Like, haven't you all had that conversation? Like, Lord, just do what I say. It's so much easier. Like, let's get on the same page, you know? And I'll be honest, I, for the last year or so, I have been facing a challenge, a problem, a, a, an issue from a place of figuring and fixing and control and stress. And so this week, I became a person who has forgotten. I forgot all God has done for me. Because he's rescued me, y'all. And we have an enemy, a giant, that wants us to forget. He wants us running in circles, under pressure, trying to find all the answers, trying to control it to death, trying to fix it, and live as though we have the resources to, 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 to figure out the solution. And, and the pressure just mounts and mounts and mounts, and we forget who we are and whose we are. It's like the airport, okay? Airports are like this, though, okay? So, like, if you're going through security, right, it's already pressure filled. There's a lot of people. And you don't want to be the one that holds up the line. And you're trying to take your shoes off and your belt and all these things. And you're, like, you know, do not, the TSA is yelling at you. You don't know what to take out of your bag, what to put in your bag. And everybody's yelling, and it's, like, a lot of pressure. And then you're, like, oh, my gosh, did I leave a bomb in my bag? Or, like, a machete. Or, like, oh, my gosh. Like, and there's just, like, this pressure mounting, and you just feel under pressure, under pressure. You forget who you are. Like, I'm someone who's going to carry a bomb when I'm going to Orlando or something. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's this pressure, and it just keeps coming, and it keeps coming, and we forget who we are. We forget who 
we belong to. We start to doubt and question what the reality really is. And I, I've been so afraid of messing up, like missing something or not having the right answer or not knowing what to do. I've just been running my soul into the ground trying to fix it or solve it or control it. And it's eating up my soul. And I've forgotten what God can do and what he has done. <coughs> but God saved me. God healed my marriage. He has broken generational curses in my life. He has rescued me from the bondage of shame. He has given me a purpose out of the pain I have endured. He has lifted my head when sadness was going to overtake me. My God has shown up time and time again, and I sit on the front lines of watching God show up time and time again for you and people in this church time and time again. Every time he has brought me into the light, and I keep forgetting. I haven't been fighting with someone who remembers. David's story, his absolute confidence in God, the ability that God will use him to lead him, to show him victory, has brought me to my knees. It made me confront my own faith. Where have my resources been lying? With me, the Lord of armies. David didn't have it all figured out. He wasn't the obvious choice. Really no reason to be confident he could beat this giant. But he knew what God could do. <coughs> Verse 38. Verse 37. May go and may the Lord be with you. Saul put on his own military clothes on David. David's a little guy. Saul's a big guy. I can just see him like being a little kid like, Wearing his dad's coat. You know, he's like, I can't. I can't do this. So he just takes it off. Can't do this. He took his own staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones, and put them in a pouch in his shepherd's bag. Then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistine came closer to David, the shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked at, saw David, he despised him because he was just a youth, healthy and handsome. Goliath's probably ugly. That's what he's saying here. He didn't like him because he was healthy and handsome. He's like, ugly guy. All right, anyways, okay, this is my own commentary. <laughs> he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And he cursed David by his gods. Come here, the Philistine called to David, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies. The God of the ranks of Israel, you have defied him. And today the Lord will hand you over to me. Today I will strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpse of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know it was not by the sword or by a spear that the Lord saves. It's for the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. And the Philistine started forward to attack him. David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. He put his hand in the bag and took out a stone and slung it and hit the Philistine in the forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. David overpowered the Philistine, killed him without a sword. He ran over, stood over him, grabbed the Philistine sword, pulled it from his sheath and used it to cut used it to kill him, he cut, then he cut off his head. When the Philistines saw their hero dead, they fled. A shepherd with stones and a sling defeated the most fierce of all opponents. How? Because he knew who was on his side. He knew the enemy wasn't bigger than his God and that his God had delivered him before and wouldn't stop now. Our enemy wants us to believe that God's going to stop being God because of you. Like your problem, your worries, your challenge is so big that God's going to stop being God, and that is a lie. Fear makes us believe the lies and the liar. That's why we have to be a people who remember. We have to be a people who set stones in the river like Joshua to remember God's faithfulness. We need to be a people like David who share stories of the victories in our own lives. We need to be a people whose scars and limps tell stories of redemption, of healing, of freedom and victory and a God who never fails. 
That's who we need to be, a people who remember. And I want to invite the band up as we are entering into a time of communion. And I was kind of having a hard time of figuring out how to wrap up this time to, to, to take communion. And then I remember communion means to remember. It means to remember that we become a people who remember the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. It, it gives us a time this morning to reflect on on all God has done, that he desires so much for us to be reconciled in relationship to him, that he gave his perfect son to pay debt for all time. And in the days before his death, Jesus introduced this new covenant to his disciples, and he told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. Remember me. Remember what I have done. Remember what these elements symbolize my broken body, my blood running from the cross, and your name on my lips. Help us, Lord, be a people who remember. Help us live as a people, fight as a people, face fear as a people who remember all God has done and promises to do. And as we take communion this morning, I just, I just ask you to reflect, sit, Hold the elements in your hand and think about what God has done in your life. Think about all the ways that he has helped you face that giant in your life, whatever that is. If you're just struggling to find something, remember you sit as a saved person for all eternity because of the sacrifice of Jesus.